I was impressed that you were up so early this morning. Money never sleeps, right? Isn't that from the movie Wall Street? Indeed it is. I'll tell you what, I was so fired up for this show, I woke up, started reading a book on economics, looking out over the ocean and thought, man, I got so much energy here. I got to burn some of it off before I get on the show. I love it. I love it. We're about to have a storm here, so I hope everything goes well. Uh, it's, the weather is, you know, it used to do things to me when I was on the East Coast. Now I'm in the West Coast. I'm in California, where I live. and But I have another place, another residence on the East Coast. But the storms will take your Wi-Fi out and... Yeah, it ruined one of the shows for me and Dean. He's still probably upset, but that's just how it went. Um, what I'm, what my goal is just to elevate your platform, is to bring out who you are, what you do, the essence of the show, and being unstoppable is you're going to deal with adversity. Right. You're going to have to channel resilience. So it's going to be part of the show in how people can do those things, have the attitude that you have, and keep moving forward. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Been following yes. you for a while. I know your stuff. I did a little bit of uh, digging, a little bit. And um, are you fr where are you from in South Africa? Are you Johannesburg originally. Yeah. Have you been? No, but um, a friend of mine lived in, I forget the city, somewhere the D, Durham, Dunham. Durban, right? Durban. Get it. Yeah, on the coast. That's awesome. We're, we're playing around technically here. That's so, okay. When did you... When did you come over? States? 22 years we've been here. So my family and I moved 22. So that's adversity right there, making that transition, thinking that we'll have something in common with Americans. Turns out we don't. No, and, I think uh, that's a good point. That's a good starting point on the background. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that was quite a journey, let me tell you. Um, so 22 years ago, and I started as a tennis pro. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, my background is tennis and very entrepreneurial, I believe anyway. So that was a journey. It was it was awesome. So from tennis pro to what was your next step? Yeah, so the interesting thing, until about two months ago, I've been working in the same company. And uh, so they found out after about 18 months, I didn't really know what I was doing on the tennis court. So they pulled me off and I got into the administration of everything that we do. And I literally went up from HR to COO to CEO and was supposed to take over the company in August, like a whole buyout deal in place. And COVID, thank wow. you. Um, it's, not, it's not a bad story. It's a good story because, again, it's all about attitude, right? These yes. things come. And so we had two, two kind of core businesses. We, the gentleman, Julian, owns two indoor tennis clubs, and that's where one of our offices were. And they would fund our business cash flow until the summers where we made some really good money working with all these different universities. So COVID arrives. He's like, Steve, I've got to close this business um, because the chances of us having something this summer for the first time in 42 years. So he closed it, which just made me start my version of it a little bit sooner. I was supposed to start it in August. And so we're just launching. It's not official. It's official, but it isn't officially launched yet. Bold Education, which has... Bold okay. training, bold summers, and bold networking. So the summers, we're just carrying on with our partners, essentially doing the same thing. We're just not using his name. But if I use, if I say CEO of Julian Krinsky Camps, is that that is no longer accurate? So that's kind of still what's on my resume, but but uh, of bold education is truly what it's going to be because I don't work for him anymore. And it's B -O -L all good, by the way. No tension there. Is in bold B O L D? Yeah. Oh, right. I'm sure there's tension. So it's bold what? Bold education, which includes training, summers, and networking. What do you What do you train? Corporate. So Dean and I have been working for a while. I've been talking to parents um, around the world for quite a long time about just Gen Z education and this generation, and more and more opportunities for speaking to corporate about how to why these people are aliens and why it's so important to bring them into. To understand them, right? I call them aliens just to get your attention. So what you're teaching is how to bridge those gaps between the generations and how people can work more effectively, correct? Yeah. And try to understand what they have a fear of. And when people fear, they generally try to destroy. And yeah. so there, we think of any kind of other generation other than ours as something that is anathema. Absolutely. I pretty much get it. I get yeah. some of it. This is going to be a lot less structured than, than Dean. Dean's very structured with... with well, I like, <laughs> very, and I love him. <laughs> no, I like to get... And he's too structured. 
I like to go down to the raw essence of who you are as much as what you do, because I think that drives what you do. Yeah. By the way, I have watch envy. I love your watch. Oh, you do? I have a couple of cool watches. So yeah. thank you. It's a really nice black one. I've seen yours too, don't worry, because I like watches. I was actually in the diamond industry in South Africa. So I look uh -oh. at jewelry. Um, my brother-in-law was in the diamond industry. So I see rings and I happen to know, notice watches as well. Thank you. Like, you weren't like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in Blood Diamond, were you? I'll tell you this, since we're not on air, my brother, I'm not even kidding you, my brother-in-law was an, he's an Israeli Jew who moved to South Africa, uh, married my, my sister. Turns out he was, an, he was assassinated in South Africa. Turns out he was part of the Israeli mob. And so that's a true story. It's, so you, sorry, you, you've got some depth here. No way. It's crazy. So uh, so what, my little time in the in the diamond space was uh, um, was pretty interesting. Not something I would share openly because I look awesome. after people's kids. <laughs> this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to open up with the Unstoppables piece. OK, I'm going to read some of the stuff about what you do, who you are. It's, you're, you're the CEO of Bold Education which specializes in youth and adult programming that turns curiosity into passion. I got all that stuff. And I'm going to let you go in deeper into what you really want to do or are doing. And this is going to be a podcast, so there's no video to the podcast, but I will give you the video. I'm going to use the video in some select spots, maybe on Instagram or, you know, maybe use them in some other form, but it won't be the, the straight video piece. It's going to be Whatever you want. Yeah, it, it works much better that way, right? We might put them on LinkedIn, do things like that. Thing is to have fun, all yeah. right? Well, I don't know, you're gonna love it. Okay, so let me read this, and then I'll, again, it won't look like this when it, you won't see it when it comes out. Are you ready? All right, let's just rock and roll here. You're tuned in to the Unstoppables, that undeniable space in the universe where you explore the minds, examine the habits, and learn the fears and failures, and then the triumphs of the undaunted, the unstoppable achiever. Welcome, my friends. My name is Bill Woodich, and today my special guest is Steve Robertson. You can call him Steven. He also told me right before we went to air that my liege works just as well. So my liege, welcome to the Unstoppables. Thank you. I'm going to make sure I play this to my wife so that she can hear you call me that. It might be something we've just started. That would be good. Yeah, I think it works with you. Steve, you are the CEO of Bold Education. you to love the name. It's an organization that specializes in youth to adult programming. It turns curiosity into a passion and then into something fungible, which is skill. Uh, you've worked from youth around the globe for almost 25 years. Now, and you consider yourself, and I think others, and based on your resume, you are a generational expert. You specialize in something that is foreign to me, sometimes anathema to me. That's Gen Z, millennials, and now even Alpha Gen, which I had to look up. So can you give me a 30,000 foot perspective, which I found fascinating before we got on the air, of what your background is, where you started, literally where you're from geographically, and then how you got here? Well, thank you so much. Um, 22, just over 22 years ago, I was in South Africa where I was born. Um, I ran a business and was in the sports space, sports industry, and I had an opportunity to um, move to America. Moved to Philadelphia 22 years ago and uh, have since been in the Philadelphia area. Recently, the Super Bowl champions, by the way. Um, and so, not very recently, but quite recently. And so More recently, uh, the my team, which is also from Pennsylvania. I know the Steelers. Steelers. Okay, so you had to just get that cut in. Why is it that people have to get that cut in on me? I used to, I had a guest yesterday. I was on a show actually, and, and, and that came up as well because the Kansas City Chiefs were her favorite. Why do you have to throw that stuff at me? Because the Steelers are so good, and we happen to win a Super Bowl, so we have to celebrate that. Okay, <laughs> and they are our in-state rivals, so that's a true part of the story. I know you're a fan. So, uh, uh, and on that one day, on that one day, I was a big fan of the Eagles as well. Oh, so, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I was, I actually watched that in Paris, believe it or not, in a hard rock cafe with my wife at some peculiar hour in the morning because that's happened to be where we were. My passion 
Bill uh, brought me to America to work with with the youth and over 22 years spent a ton of time working with the uh, millennial group and then Gen Z and we right now also work of course with Alpha and I'll just close that thought by saying this what really um, has been a passion for us has been to truly walk alongside these generations when they're in their youth and call them to a higher version destiny of themselves and um, in so doing, we have learned a lot on, on the way. Well, you know, the way to limit any experience is by the prejudice of stereotype, by the confirmation bias that we're going to see what we already believe. So a lot of times in the work in corporate America and talking with other CEOs across the country, we think there's a code that people can crack and we haven't been able to crack for the most part with millennials. I, I treat those I treat millennials as people. Say so I don't look at there's a, a a certain you know type, or there's a, a precast notion that I have. I think they're people. So I come at it from a different place. For you to be able to teach, to be able to involve or ingratiate yourself with any group, first you have to be open, and then you have to understand. So how do you approach any group? What's your mindset? of understanding, learning, and then being able to experience and then maybe coach? Well, I love where you position yourself. And the truth is that that disposition is rather rare. We are really um, excited to be able to put people in a box. It just makes life easier, less complicated, right? And so, okay, well, you're a Steelers fan, so that tells me all I need to know. And um, the, the, the interesting part of this journey is as a business to be successful, we figured out early on, and this business was 42 years old, uh, 40, we've seen hundreds of thousands of students from more than 100 countries in their youth spend summers on university campuses in and around the United States. And so you get to learn a lot about your customer. And what's really valuable uh, is understanding that what who your customer is, is critical. Understanding what it is that they value, how they want it. And so as a result of that, we've had to stay nimble as a business in order to stay in business. And as generations change, as they adapt, as new things form them, which I really believe is true, by the way, um, we've had to adjust for that. So one of the things that's really interesting that you mentioned is that we like to, uh, in corporate America, just think of people as, as groups. And what we've seen, there's a gentleman by the name of Bruce Tolgan, who speaks about an epidemic of under-management. And really that epidemic of under-management speaks to everybody's in a box. What Gen Z taught us is that this customized, on-demand, human, individual, is what is currently what we have to deal with in the workplace, at home. And so it truly speaks to what you were saying. You truly have to get to know people on, a, on an individual basis if you want to encourage them, if you want to lead them well, if you want to be a part of their journey. And so I love your positioning there. You know, it's easy to, for, like you said, it's easy to force people into a box. We're safe with that because we think we know and we feel safe. We don't want to challenge our assumptions. We don't want to shake the anchor of our belief system. And we believe that this group is bad because of this, this, they're entitled, they're gonna do these things that it really predisposes our action. And, and so I am very aware and I attempt at all times to limit that and open my door to people as people. And you know what? This may surprise people, but I will tell you it's no different than any other generation I've ever dealt with. You get to the core of what people want. Maybe today things have to happen a little faster but who said that waiting around for the gold watch was, you know, the rite of passage in my time that that proves to be something important today. Speaking of watches, by the way, I'm going to say two things about you. Number one, I have watch envy. I saw your watch <laughs> flash up. And if people that can't see this, you got an unbelievable watch on. Number two, I know all I need to know about you from your background. It is so neat. You got a beautiful bookcase and it's nice. It's neat. It's got a little vestige of some South Africa back there. It looks like a giraffe. <laughs> or some kind of Rorschach test, but, but, I'm, but I'm loving your background. I think you're neat and you're on point as opposed to me. 
who people will tell you I'm pretty much maybe a rambling discursive. And sometimes I don't want you to see what's behind the curtain. So it's all <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you talked about corporate America. You've got a great pedigree, and I want the serious listener to be able to understand and, and then really pay attention to what you're saying. Based just on credibility alone, you've worked with University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League school, Yale University. What do you like? You like the Ivy Leagues. Oh, and, yes. And the NFL, which that is a variety, my friend. So what do you bring into those classrooms? Tell me about your curriculum and what you're bringing. The beautiful part about um, this customized generation, this on-demand generation, is what we've been able to establish is what certain segments are really interested in. So from a programming perspective, what we've been able to offer is just about anything you can imagine. But in the case of Gen Z, and truthfully in the case, as you already said, many people, at some point we start to deep dive. And so we offer things from medicine to business to robotics and give students an opportunity to, while they're still at high school, try on some identities, try on some experiences to try and figure out who is it that I'm enjoying being. And this whole concept of identity gets a little bit scary on, 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 the, on the broader, on the outside of that, that kind of graph. But understanding who you are is a really important part of figuring out where you're going to go. So we really partner with, with professors at all these really cool universities um, to bring some really good content. We also bring a lot of opportunity to connect with other people from around the globe and um, practice being who you want to be. Practice who you think you are. Um, and it's not just about identity. It's about a number of things like figuring out how to communicate and communicate well, figuring out how to be in spaces that are a little awkward for you and stretching you. And while we don't market that, that's not a marketing slogan yeah. that brings a lot of people in, but it's something that we uh, have as part of what we call an invisible curriculum where we stretch people gently because that's where growth happens. Are you familiar with Carol Dweck? I'm going to be embarrassed if I say no, but no, okay. it should be. Well, let's just drop out two buckets that she found. Fixed mindset, growth mindset. So what you're doing is working with people who have a growth mindset, the people that are able to adapt, they're able to challenge themselves, that aren't fixed on a certain grade or an outcome, but they're based on the process. In the way you love and stretching invisible barriers, you're the, the plasticity not only of the mind, but of the attitude is found when you do these two things. And you are earning the moniker of my liege when you say this. I think I have found it is incumbent upon yourself to find yourself. Know thyself was something Socrates found at the Oracle of Delphi. You've got to know yourself before you ever know what you want to be, who you are. And you got to be consistent and congruent with who you are at your very core. Huge. And you know, to me, Stephen, what warps that is ego. Who do I want to be and pretend on a card? How many cars do I drive? Where do I live? Those are all representations of what I want the social construct to believe that I am as a person. Sometimes they're antithetical. And that's the root to me of unhappiness. So what you're doing in gently nudging, stretching, and encouraging is brilliant. You earned the moniker of my liege with that. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I, if I take it back a step, you know, without putting people in boxes, Corporate America, marketing America, data rich America and data rich world is going to argue and they have a real point that there are some real congruences and similarities. And that's why all this data is out there that then boxes millennials and Gen Z's in a certain way. But it's not so much only about the data. The data for us is to enrich our perspective on someone, on even a group of people so that we can figure out how to connect with them better. The beauty of this whole connection, and you said it as well, is that every generation thinks that the generation that came after them doesn't get it. And every current generation thinks the generation that came before them are clueless. Right. right. What's, what, I've, what we have found, and we are working again in this invisible curriculum space to, to transition through, is that Gen Z, are the most amazingly creative entrepreneurial generation and there's data around that but one of the things where they're needing some help with 
is understanding that previous generations had incredible legacy to pass on to them. And so part of what we're trying to do is bridge that gap, present an opportunity for this youth to be who they are, experience, create, be entrepreneurial, but figure out how to get permission to speak into their lives. Because if you don't have that permission, you are just this, what I call a sage on stage. You're just the person up there speaking and truly they don't need to listen to you in this day and age. So there's a lot that's changed, but the core concepts of pursuing people for the right reason without a hook and not to manipulate are still so important. If you really want to be of value in people's lives, and we do, that's what's required. And I want to be of value in the youth's lives because they are the ones that are determining what tomorrow is going to look like. And no matter what industry, I want to draw a parallel to what you're talking about and speaking of, and I I wrote this down. You are practicing the art of enrollment. You're not selling with a hook or something that's come and do this because I want to get this for me. You're actually enrolling the hearts and minds. You're rolling it by getting to know the person as a person, getting to know what they want, what they need, and let them have a voice. And I love what you said about asking permission. You are not an intruder or an interloper if you are asking for permission. Sounds like me with some of my, you know, some of the people I've known in life that I have to knock on the door like a vampire to be invited in. And they probably <laughs> want to kick me out after that. But, but you, th- those are important. That people will say, okay, this Stephen sounds great. He sounds fantastic. But what are some of the tools that I can take right now in my company? What tools can I use to try to bridge and break down some of that, some of the barrier and some of the gap? That is such a big question, Bill, and thank you for asking it because um, for a small fee, I will be able to. I'm just kidding, right? So, but it <laughs> is a really hook. Big question. I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> for, it, it's a really big question. For me, truly, what I've discovered, uh, and this has been in the last four years, is that most people don't yet get that there are some fundamental differences with Gen Z to other generations. So that is a really important concept to get. When you take that away and your lens changes and you're not just looking at a recent grad as, oh, just a recent grad going through a phase that is now part of my business, which could be true, right? And is true. And you understand some of the other components that make them who they are. um, It gives you a different mindset through which to manage. And so the first thing I would say is that Management going forward, if you want to future-proof yourself and your business, management and leadership going forward will never be the same again. And I'm not talking about, okay, let's redo everything. I'm just talking about corporate America and parents have for a long time been hands-off. And it's been a sink or swim mentality, which has been spectacular for the self-driven, organized, motivated people. But typically, management or leadership has just come in when they haven't been happy with the thing. What we are seeing now is that the most successful companies will be practicing customized individual leadership, which means the corporate annual reviews. No, we're talking about daily check-ins and we're talking about living in a world where we live bite-sized piece to bite-sized piece of content that we consume and young employees who are, by the way, have, by the way, been CEOs of their own lives since almost day one. Mm. I'll eat when I want. I'll watch what I want, when I want. I'll Uber when I want. I'll work in the gig economy when I want. Now come into the workplace and you're trying to manage them in the way that the industrial revolution caused us to run businesses. And it just isn't going to work. It's Well, certainly it will work for a while. But if you want to be really positive and effective, customizing your leadership with each person is critical. In other words, getting to know them, figuring out how to bring the best out of them and what it is that you need to do in the relationship with them to make that uh, combinational relationship the most powerful. I'm, I am on board with you, and I'm going to give you the cynic's response, but I'm going to give you first my response. I am on board with you. I live this. I uh, think you are prescient in where this is going. If it's not there now is customized individual leadership. Absolutely 100%, which takes a certain amount of mentorship, of effort, of of willingness, and then aptitude on the behalf of the mentor. And the mentee has to be willing to take the lesson 
and that's how we grow forward. The cynic would say, I'm a company of 3,000 people. Uh, that looks like I can only get to so many. My direct reports get to so many. We don't get to all, and therefore it's kind of a bias. We're kind of, we're not fair. We're discriminating. We're take, what, what do I do with that? Well, you just take a look in the rearview mirror at a company like Kodak. Kodak wasn't a small company. And so I'm not here as a doom and gloom. I'm here as you can continue as you are, but those who look at ways to be a new version of themselves tomorrow are certainly going to be a better version. And so when you look at Gen Z, the oldest of which are around 24, the youngest of which are around 10, we're talking about eight or so years until just about every one of those are in the workplace. Okay. We're also looking at a generation that is about 40% of the global spend right now. Do you want customers? Well, you have to take the time to figure out who they are. So when that young employee gets in, it is your responsibility to get to know how they tick because not only are you going to bring the best out of them, which is going to impact your company, you're going to get a look at what the market is doing, what the market is saying, how the market wants to engage. You don't get it yet. Until you do that, you may have some of those pieces of the puzzle, but my point is you've got to get with this generation to get this generation because they are fundamentally different and they are going to determine how things are bought and sold, how communication happens, and they're honestly already doing that. It's, it's called agility and adaptation, and it strikes right to the core of our unwillingness to change. That's the first place it has to happen is we got to be okay with, not, with knowing that we don't know. And that's right. tough for a, for a person who's who thinks they've earned a position or a title and don't they don't want to shake that ego. They've wrapped themselves in the cloak of that invincibility, and sometimes the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> but it takes agility and that form of adaptation you're talking about. And, and I want to we talked about differences. Tell me some of the similarities because we really want to build on similarities. What are some of the similarities among the different generations that you really build on? Well, the similarities are the desire to connect the desire to be heard and understood. I'm not gonna go to the heartbeat, walk on two legs for the most part, that those kind of similarities, because that's about it, right? Okay. Technology, how we engage with the world and technology and all those things have made things, uh, us really different. But if on the base level, when you, when you look at what people really desire, they want an opportunity to figure out who they are, they want an opportunity to connect and be able to find those common places with each other and in a society specifically today or especially today that is very isolated you don't realize how much you value that connection until you connect and so that's one of the similarities i think the 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 opportunity to say what you know and what you have to share is valuable and that means something to me we all do really well in that space and i want to say this that we do not have to find common ground on a million things. We just have to find common ground on one thing. Now you can start to build a relationship. And when you look at the various generations, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z in the workplace, and even older boomers that are in, still in the workplace, you don't have to be matches. You don't have to be clones of each other. In fact, that's the worst thing to try and do. Just find common ground in one place, and then you can start. <clears throat> to I have two millennials in here. And they're both shaking their head yes. Yeah, <laughs> I like them. <laughs> so you're, you're getting the audience vote. And I want, you know, I was, I'm, I'm thinking about this. And as you're speaking, I'm thinking you, this isn't a career. And I wrote crusade, but that didn't end well. You're really on a mission. I mean, this is a mission. It's, it's, it's changing or influencing hearts and minds one at a time. And it's a mission. Well, you just said the word that is one of my, my like crusades. In a good way. <laughs> it's influence. And so the conversation for me always is to get people to understand the currency, the economy we live in today is an economy of influence. The currency is influence. And that's going to be a freaky thing for some people. But when you get it and you understand that all of us but specifically Gen Z and Alpha, follow multiple influences in their lives. You start to see the power of influence. And if you as a parent, as a leader, don't get in line to influence your employees well, and again, this is not manipulation, 
you are missing an opportunity. And let me just say this, there are no spaces in the line of people waiting to influence me and or you. So it's not like there's a gap and, oh, I'll just come in there. The yeah. line, you have to budge to get into that line. Yes. But you if you choose, sorry, say again. You earn your way in that line. Yes. But here's the responsibility that older generations have, is that if you understand that it is our responsibility to influence these generations well, then it changes your attitude. And attitude is so much about everything, right? So influence <laughs> is key. And that's where it can begin, by just understanding that. You, you know, I'm going to be transparent with you. I, I like people that think like me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I value people that don't. But, but, but you said, I, I want to point out something with leadership that I've, I've spoken about before, and you're nailing this thing, and I don't want the audience to miss this. This is one of the most important parts I think we're talking about, is to me, leadership power is finite. Leadership authority is finite. Authority power. You need both at some point, at some times. It's, it's expedient to do. But the thing that is exponential is influence. Influence. That's exponential. Power is finite. There's always a certain level. You, you, you turn your voice on deaf ears after a certain point, people will leave. You'll leave your best people. They'll leave you. The hearts and minds you have left is just overhead. Influence is the key. And you got right to the heart of it. I love your style. Speaking of style, you have a book, Parenting the Disconnected Generations. Tell me about the inspiration for writing that book. So it'll be done by the end of summer. <clears throat> it's called Aliens Among Us and um, the Disconnected Generation. And, and the purpose of that, first of all, is when you understand that this generation are aliens, you start to look at them differently. And that's my heart. I need you to see them differently so that you behave differently in terms of influencing and guiding them. The Disconnected Generation, in fact, People are, should say, what do you mean they disconnect? They should say, no, they're the most connected generation. And in fact, they are. They're the most connected, but at the same time disconnected. And that's why this premise or concept of influence is so important, is because influence will allow you to slowly draw them out of isolation. And I'm not suggesting they're all isolated, and they're not all introverts, they're not at all. But generally speaking, that data is real. And... Uh, the heart of this book is to awaken people to the concept that we have aliens among us, but also to show people that, in fact, we are becoming like those aliens. So I speak about this movie that was shot in South Africa called uh, District 9. It's not a great movie. In fact, I loved it. But uh, <laughs> these aliens land in Johannesburg and they set up camp there. And they eventually, uh, one gentleman who plays uh, Murdoch in the A-Team in a, the later version of the movie um, he becomes infected by one of these aliens and becomes one of them and that's what's happening in our world and I think people don't realize it yet the perfect storm that has created Gen Z is slowly trickling to us they just adopted adapted really quickly because that's what they were born into and so uh, that's a journey that we all have to realize and I'm trying to share that with the, in the book that get it because it's important that you do because you're becoming one of them. And if you don't, there's a very real possibility that your influence will wane very quickly and your ability to be a functional part of society. And I'm not trying to be too heavy is just not going to be the same if you don't make those take those steps to figure out who these people are because they're determining what tomorrow will look like. And, and would I be correct in saying that this is the time for the early adapters? Because there hasn't been enough. You know, this is the early adapter phase, which is always the risky phase, but it is also the breakthrough phase. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. 100% yes. Now, let me dive down into something that's personal, because I think we can cut and paste this from a number of places. And I look to people who look in different places to give proscribed or prescribed variations of this term. But I want your term. How do you, Stephen, my liege, define success? Oh, yeah. And you're right. I've read, I've read so many versions of that. But for me, um, and I'm a, I'm a spiritual guy. So for me, um, I feel like I have a mission. I feel like I'm on this earth for a really finite period of time. I've gone through trying to figure out who I am and grow my hair and cut my hair and do all the things I'm supposed to try and do to figure out who I am, travel the world to, to find myself. And uh, I find that those things are so temporal 
Um, like getting a, a nice watch is amazing for a week or so. I'm all excited to wear it. Um, and then that wanes very quickly. But what doesn't wane are the things where you have the ability to impact people's lives without a hook, give without expecting something back. And I think the journey we are on to pursue a, a generation or generations um, is so exciting because the seeing how they are impacted, how they uh, receive and how their journey is uh, modified by this interaction brings such joy. That is success. It's funny, the money comes afterwards because the money will come when you're doing what you need to do. Um, but that part is something I pray we will never lose sight of because um, that brings that way Wake up every morning with a smile on your face and join your heart in the spring in your step. And truthfully, I could be hit by a car tomorrow. And so I just want to live today, taking small steps to where I'm hoping to get, not getting stuck because I've been stuck before, and just making sure that I'm making progress every day. And it's great to have a vision when you see a generation that is incredible. But it's also just please know it's not just about this generation because once you touch their lives in an amazing way, they impact the older generations, the parents as well. So it's while we are pursuing the youth, the youth have impact on everybody. So I'm not doing this in exclusion to millennials and or Gen X or it's a, it's it's just a starting point. And I'm very excited about that. And to me, that is success where we can be a part of people's lives, helping them figure out who they are and who the best version of themselves or what the best version of themselves looks like. You have an attitude and an energy that seems to me to, to have not have been dented or distilled by the foibles of human nature. Yeah, in spite in spite of all evidence, you're pushing on. And I, I think, and this is in concert with one of my former guests, the CEO, Sean Crabtree, talked about, and that is in every task you're doing, make sure you're tying a purpose to it. What that what's the purpose? And yours, that mission of changing those lives. One at a time, you understand the ephemeral nature of life. You you understand how short-lived it truly is. And you know that the curse of happiness is the when and if. When I get the watch, when I get the car, when I get the house, I'll be happy. If I get it, I'll be happy. And then it arrives and you're back on the hedonic treadmill because none of that's satisfied. You're filling that void from within because you understand who you are from within. And I salute you for that. By the way, that was probably one of my best segments I've ever done. And I'm calling it out right now. <laughs> so my humor goes with me, whether you get it or not. It's right. So <laughs> you know the other side of that coin. You know, people don't want the dirty stuff, the the stuff that breaks your nails, the stuff that keeps you up at night, the stuff that that has you just in distress is failure. Terrible term for a lot of people. It's an encouraging term for some who consider it setback and a way forward. So you've had to have failure in your life. Tell me about your biggest failure. What did you take from that and learn from that? Wow. So uh, failures along the way, I'm just glad they're not dead people because the path would be littered with corpses, right? And so um, a friend of mine who you actually know, Dean Minuto, we've spent a lot of time talking about this concept of always becoming. And so when you say what is your biggest failure, um, I don't know which one it is, but I can tell you that every single failure that I've had has got me to where I am today. And so um, I have failed multiple times and I often do that multiple times a day. The biggest one, it, it's not about size for me. It's about an attitude through which you go. Now, I haven't been gloriously wonderful going through every single failure. Um, but what I, what I have been really deliberate about doing is understanding that we're in a process of always becoming. And if I do not take the opportunity to to um, look at a failure. Yes, take the time to mourn and, and beat myself and blame all the people that I need to blame, but come back really quickly to saying, okay, well, what's next? And what's the next step? If I don't get there, so I know I haven't really answered your question because I don't want to give one favor glory over another. The combination of failures that I've gone through have got me where I am today. And where I am today is amazing, but I'm almost more excited about where I'm going to be tomorrow. Failing is just part of what we do because I'm not the smartest man in the room. Um, and so I understand that I'm going to make some mistakes. But truthfully, it doesn't scare me. And it used to. So the biggest failure was fearing failure. And I'm learning on a daily basis not to fear it. 
And the amount of time I spend fearing that failure or happening is becoming less and less and less. So for me, that's the biggest failure. And that's the one that I feel like I'm dealing with best. You know, Stephen, when I grew up in that backwoods of Western Pennsylvania, outside of the big city of Philadelphia, it wasn't even close to Pittsburgh. You know, I grew up and my biggest fear was to come up short of my own expectations because to me, success was all about the realization of those expectations. And I thought, if I go out and put myself out and I come up short, what do I do with myself? Wow. And when you talk about the process of becoming, if you're going to evolve, you are always adapting and changing. And that implies setbacks, changes, iterations to different things. You are in the pantheon of the greats that have been on the show, of which there have been a number, I'm fortunate to say, uh, that have a hard time with that word because they just really can't figure out what it really means because they've had so many, but it really isn't a failure. It's just a way of learning, a process of becoming a setback. So that, that elevates you to the top, my liege. So <sighs> extremely good. And I want to ask you this question with the R word because it's important if we're ever going to move forward in life. And I think this you imbue this, but how important is resilience in in just in life and the process of becoming, which I love, by the way. Oh, so resilience, we focus on, on really three invisible um, skills that we teach people that come to us without them knowing. And uh, communication is one of them. Soft skills that generally the youth are weak at. Uh, problem solving. And then the third one is resilience or grit. And the reason why that's so important is in our on-demand custom world where um, if this download isn't fast enough, if, if um, Amazon can't get me that thing in a day or two, I will find another vendor. This concept of problem solving and resilience just isn't there. So I don't know how much you know about tennis. My background is tennis and I played a lot. And um, if you ever grew up in Europe, you played on clay tennis courts like the French Open. And what clay tennis courts do is they form resilience because or they, they because the points on a clay court last very, very long. I grew up in Johannesburg, high altitude. You hit the ball, it flies like a bullet. And so points are really short in Johannesburg. Who's the best? Who's the best clay player? There's, there's somebody that always wins on clay. Rafael Nadal is a spectacular. That's the guy. That's the one. Resilience. He's learning how to get that grit and to just get in there. Now, for me, honestly, it is why it's one of the three core things we focus on because I believe it's one of the three key things this generation needs to be future proof for tomorrow. If we do not help them develop grit and perseverance, they will never achieve what they should achieve they will never amount to the people that they need that they're supposed to that ability to push through is where growth comes from that ability that is where invention and progress comes from is where you push through that do the extra push up the extra setup yes. go one more day yes you that that's a muscle it's almost a muscle where you're pushing a little further. So tomorrow, you know, the next day, it's just a little easier to do yeah. because you're doing the work. That was an excellent, by the way, metaphor. You're doing the work now. Where can we find you? Because you're, you are spewing some brilliance across this screen at me, and I'm trying to catch all of it. I want to catch <laughs> more of it, and I want to direct the audience there. Where can we find you? Um, well, probably the best is to find me on my personal website, Stephen with a V, J Robertson. Dot com And I only picked that because the regular Stephen Robertson wasn't available. Okay, so I'm not a fan of middle names. Stephen J. Robertson. Don't ask me what it stands for. John. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's probably the best. I love um, connecting and networking. And I would be happy to speak to anybody about what we've learned over the last number of years, seeing hundreds of thousands of kids now who are parents and are employers. And um, so connecting really inspires me. Well, there's about four or five points that I could make into workshops on this if I was inclined to do workshops. I've, uh, I'm probably not the best at doing a workshop, but I am the, the sage on, would you say the sage on stage anyway? Yep. <laughs> so it's the precursor for a workshop, right? If you could write a paragraph, this is your walk away, all right, as a spiritual, enlightened spiritual person that understands the short time we have on, on this earth and you want to be able to share beyond you, beyond your years, you could write a paragraph for someone to read and learn from something that is Stephen Jay's way. What would that paragraph look like? Well, I'm going to steal a little bit from maybe Zig Ziglar. Um, he speaks about attitude, not aptitude, determining your altitude. And 
every day we have a choice to make. I spoke to my kids growing up and I said, especially my son, my son's older than my daughter, both turned out wonderful kids. And my son didn't fancy school. And I would say to him, you're there anyway. While you're there, make the best of it. And so the takeaway I would say is every day when you wake up, you have a choice. Your attitude for that day is everything. And let me tell you, your attitude will and can change the day. Do it and you'll see that it's true. Man, I, I'm giving you a virtual hug across the screen. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Even if you're here, we got to be like 18 feet apart. But that was that was that was excellent. And I, I want to tell you, the only addition that I can see that you need to that library are two books written by an extremely brilliant man with who's having a pretty good hair day. Always <laughs> fail more. <laughs> I know about them both. <laughs> well, you're going to have them on your bookshelf. This is The Unstoppables. My name is Bill Woodich, and uh, check me out at Bill Woodich. That's W-O-O-D-I-T-C-H. Uh, if you'd like a direct message, we can get on a coaching call. I can answer your direct messages. That is within reason, <laughs> within reason, within my level of ability. Think, don't overthink is my thought for the day. Act, act boldly. I'm reminded of Alexander the Great, the days of the ancient Greeks, and the story goes that uh, an ancient king said, the person that can untie the Gordian knot will rule all of Asia. And Alexander, well, he lived to be 33 years of old. He didn't have much time to untie things, but he did have a sword. He took out that sword and he said, I'll find a way to undo this thing. And he cut it. Now that, my friends, is acting boldly. Don't overthink. Think and act decisively. Until next time, again, this is Bill Woodich. Talk to you later. E e I loved having you on the show, man. Loved it. Thank you. You're so user-friendly, Bill. Uh, well, so you make it really easy. Let me tell you, you know, no, you were, you got.